In 2010, I planted a new church in Los Angeles, a church that would intentionally include those that were no longer in the church, who were disengaged from the church, and I wanted to offer an alternative, a place where people can be themselves, a place where they could explore their faith without judgment, a place where they could discover forgiveness and see God in one another. I imagined a church building is where I needed to start. Instead, I started at a mission, right in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. Some people call it the Skid Row community, the unhoused mecca of the world. And there, I agreed to become a pastor of a mission to preach five days a week at their chapel service to pray for a room full of unhoused individuals. Some were ex-gangsters, prior felons, drug addicts, prostitutes, alcoholics, thieves, you name it. But in that room were also people of many ages, genders, identities, ethnicities, races. There were hundreds of beautiful humans that I got to know more day after day. I saw firsthand and lived long days among the poor, among the hungry, the addicted, the rejected and excluded. And so the beginning journey of church planting was a paradox, a puzzle, a mystery, an oddity, a contradiction, shall we say. Thirdly, This is not church planting, because the church plants I had visited up to that point were located in nice and safe neighborhoods, located with uh, with new and clean facilities. There was one mom and one dad and two children. Everything seemed perfect, normal, a normal group of people, a normal church, a normal people. But who gets to decide what is normal? Through this season of life, I experienced what I never thought I would ever experience. Smiles on the faces of the poor. Satisfaction in the tummies of the hungry. Laughter coupled with tears all at the same time because of the love of God. And when someone would get out of line, because that would happen from time to time, it is, after all, skid row, as leaders, we would come to our senses. We would show mercy, love, extend blessing, extend prayer and goodness, even when they didn't deserve it. Today, I can share my discernment with this, why did God start me with the poor and the hungry? It was my training ground. God said, oh, so you want to start a church, huh? Then start here among the poor, among the hungry, the rejected, and the abused. God was showing me how to love. God was showing me how to act. God was showing me how to imitate the way of the divine. Those were some of the most formative years of my life, not only as a pastor, but as a student of Jesus. I went off and I planted that church. Over the years, we baptized over 75 people. Many people came to our church. I never have seen so much healing and so much reconciliation and so much liberation until that time. I titled today's sermon, God is Paradox. Let me ask you, what truly constitutes happiness? You know, most of wisdom literature asserts that a a harmonious reaction, an agreeable or peaceful response, that leads 
to compromise. But not so in this Jesus wisdom. Instead, the state of happiness, the blessedness, which is accurately described or translated as happy are, can only be discovered when one does the paradoxical thing. But who in their right mind desires the opposite of happiness, the contradictory action, the troublesome act? Who wishes to be poor, to be hungry, to be weeping, to be hated? Perhaps this is a notice, a warning, shall we say, of the guilt, of the fact of these blessings and woes is vital to the understanding of such wisdom. To speak about such a paradox, about such contradictions, is to put the end to the values of this world all put together. To say, happy are the poor, and woe to the rich, is a challenge to human life itself. It is the reorientation of how to be human. That's how massively influential these words were to ancient antiquity, and yet I wonder how influential are those words today for us. Perhaps you say, those words sound familiar, Pastor Moses. They do echo the blessings and the attitude found in Matthew's Gospel. However, here in Luke's Gospel, this added set of rules is added to the original list. And the poor and the hungry, they're not so over-spiritualized. They are not presented as poor in spirit or as hungry for righteousness. Instead, they are plainly presented as the poor and the hungry. As in the poor and the hungry who do not expect anything from humanity, but expect everything from the divine. And here's where we are confronted this morning with a hard-hitting gospel, shall we say. I love saying that. Because there is good news for the poor and the hungry, but the good news abounds also for the rich and full as well. But this kind of wisdom is for those who do not romanticize Jesus, for those who make love not sentimental but active, for those who understand, do to others as you would want done, is not the ultimate response, rather to do as God would do. That is the ultimate response. And so to live by this great reversal, in, in teaching, by the way, that is unique to Jesus only, okay? To Jesus alone. To love your enemies. To do good to those who hate you. To bless those who curse you. To pray for those who abuse you. Now that demands graciousness. That demands to rethink things, which is what repentance means, right? To change one's mind. To come to one's senses. And here is where I want to encourage you to invite the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us is our comforter, this is it, our counselor, our guide, our help, our intercessor. To invite that Spirit of God to come into us, to only, not only speak to us, not only to move in us, to, but to move through us and around us. To allow that kind of Spirit to speak, to move, to teach and to heal. Because perhaps what needs to happen this morning is we need to understand, we need to be taught what is at the center of these blessings and woes to reveal to us why should one love enemy while the rest of the world says differently? Why? So what what truly engenders happiness. Because to live a paradoxical life is not meant for personal satisfaction. It is not so that others can speak highly of you, nor is it to receive some kind of special treatment. Rather, we live in paradox because this 
is the way that God lives. This is the way that God acts. This is the way that the divine moves. God is paradox. And blessed are you who is struggling to hold on this morning, for you will receive your reward. Blessed are you who are overcoming evil with goodness. There is hope and light at the end of this time. And to you who are rich, with disposable income, with abundance of resources, what are you doing with all of those blessings? Have you ever considered that the divine has given you all those blessings and all those resources in order to do every possible thing on earth to change the condition of the poor and of the hungry? And you can do it in charity by working for systemic change in this world. But woe to the rich who hold on to their wealth, who accumulate it and hoard it. Let this be your warning, your call to repentance, the prompt for you to change your mind, to come to your senses. The book of Romans says, weep with those who weep. As privileged and rich people, one cannot ignore the tears of the saints around us. As students of Jesus, we are called to an elevated ethical view and response. It's a even if it contradicts our natural and human inclinations. You see, I guess what I want to submit to you this morning is really a question, perhaps. Can you grasp the paradox of God? Can you accept the contradiction, the oddity, the paradox of God. Is it true that to love enemy is the best choice there is? There is something about loving enemy. When you love your enemy, you set your enemy free. But by doing so, you set yourself and when you set yourself free, you are then open to a possible healing and reconciliation of self. There's a possibility to put an end to this ongoing cycle of retaliation and violence. We put an end to it. And somehow, we have this desire for justice in the world, right? But somehow we fail to have mercy alongside of that justice. We forget that God is justice, but God is also mercy. And that we are called to imitate this God of justice, this God of paradox, this God of mercy. And I think of this passage, if it could be rewritten in 2022, this is the way I would rewrite it. Happy are those who are ready and willing to listen. Happy are those who cry out for justice with one arm on high and a closed fist, while simultaneously reaching out with mercy through stretching out the other arm with an open palm. Blessed are those who work towards systemic change for the disadvantaged, for the rejected, the hated, for you are acting like God. Thank you. Blessed are those who descend to the bottom, who move from the center to the edges, for you are following the path of the divine. Happy are those who place people over economy, who put uh, who put humans above ideologies, who choose human beings over religious practices, who choose faith over fear. Blessed are those who choose the way of the divine, love first, people first, healing first, 
over the way of the world, possessions, power, and pleasure. You know, this is often why people say, Pastor Moses, why do you advocate for these kinds of people? I advocate because I think of people first, humans first, gay humans, trans humans, humans with many tax brackets, black and brown humans, indigenous humans, humans of many faiths and of diverse family makeups, humans of diverse ages, children, youth, adults, and elders. By the way, if I haven't said this, if I say this today loud and clear to you, I am so proud of our elders at Calvary Bible Church. If you're in the room, then yeah, 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 that works, yeah. If you're in the room today and you know who you are, please know that I honor you and that I'm so glad you are here. You know, I call you village elders. I don't know if you know this, but I do. I call you village elders because it has great significance to me. In my Mayan indigenous ancestry, village elders were the ones who would cure the tribe members of their illness. Here. Who would diagnose the sicknesses and cure the tribe. They were the doctors, the, the healers, the miracle workers. They would use plants and herbs to cure the tribe of their sicknesses. And then they would observe their young people running around, playing, and they would recognize in them the gift of healing. And they would mentor them in that gift. And so for a Mayan person, the gift of healing was a central piece of the responsibility in the world. Perhaps this is why I share with you this morning Jesus, the healer of this world. The one that removes the restrictions, the lies, the things that impede us from fullness of life here and now, to heal us from the modern day illnesses. But what are those? Well, like fear, laziness. Here's another busyness. Judgment, anger, doubt, pride, and addiction. If you don't acknowledge enough in the church, he's ill. We don't even acknowledge uh, in the American Christian church that how deeply, deeply sick the church is. We need to be healed from our sins. Judgment, racism, colonization, white supremacy homophobia, and our love for possessions, buildings, budgets, programs, and for placing that above people or over people. Maybe I'm like Jesus this morning. Like the Hebrew prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures, I come to you with a notice and with a warning. Christianity as a whole Eastern Orthodoxy, Catholicism, Protestantism, Evangelicalism, Pentecostalism, awaken from your slumber. The global pandemic has changed the world. Humanity is no longer the same. Things have been fast-forwarded by ten years. And if the church does not reform itself, if it doesn't amend itself, if it doesn't renew itself, if it does not correct its wrongdoings, it won't die. It'll be much worse than that. It will only exist for itself. Without the heart hitting gospel, there is no good news for the poor and for the rich. Still, mercy abounds, and God is healing us and gave us Jesus. The healer of the world came to earth, died on a cross for all humanity, takes away our sins, our failures, mistakes, our unwillingness to listen, and gives us his forgiveness, his grace, his successes, and his righteousness. And resurrected from the dead three days later, Jesus 
the apex of reality, the omega point of history, gives us liberation this morning. Liberation, liberation, liberation. And so blessed are the liberated students of Jesus who reform for they shall see this world healed by God. And blessed are the liberated rich who come to their senses, for they shall change the unjust systems of this world. And blessed are the liberated addicts, the busy ones, the prideful ones, the doubters, the lazy ones, the ones who are afraid, for they shall be healed here and now. We receive your healing. We receive your paradise. Word of God and word of life, we all say together, thanks be to God. Do you pray with me this morning?